During the month of May in the year 2010, uh, about 11 years ago, Obama was rounding his second year as the president of, of the illegal president of the United States of America. And I was holding a trial here at the Outlaw War Missionary Church. And it was a Saturday night. And I was here in this area now, my study, uh, working on uh, my legal, if you will, evidence and my moves, um, the presentation during that trial that lasted nearly seven days here at the Outlaw War Missionary Church. It was at 9, 10 o'clock at night, and I'm sitting here, and I hear this ramming noise, this banging noise. It sounded like a tank was running into the church. So we go, I, I go outside with a couple of the men that were with me, and there were several men that lived in this area, lived on the block, and then several men from around the community were outside the church. Now, the police knew that I was holding the trial, so they'd put up those those bicycle rack type of uh, things that that fence in people, forget what you call them now, and they had locked them around the church. These, they, and, and the police had left. These men now had taken these things, these steel bicycle rack type things, and they were ramming them into the front gate of the church, ramming them into the, and I, the front gate of the church is made out of steel. And so we went out there and saw what they were doing and called the police. Well, the police were already on alert that our church was a hot spot. And they came instantly. They had somebody right on the spot. So a, several police cars came up, and a police sergeant or somebody came up with a white shirt on and a, a several other blue shirt police officers. And I explained to them. And the men didn't run. They didn't leave. They were still there standing with the thing in the hand. They were trying to rain. So I told the police what they were doing. And then the police told me, told me he said, um, well, you know, the reason why they're trying, to, they're trying to tear down your church is because you're holding a trial against Obama. And if you, and they said to me again, this police sergeant, he said, if you, weren't trying to, if you weren't holding a trial against Obama, they'd be home sleeping somewhere. And he got in his squad car and left. That's right. He didn't offer me any protection. He didn't offer me any help. He didn't say to them they had to leave. He didn't. He did not. He did. Let, me, let me say this. For I, I, I've, I've said that uh, even today, uh, I, f I, I felt safer in Brooklyn House of Detention or Rayford Prison than I do uh, here in Harlem. Uh, I told Elizabeth last night, you drive, when I come out uh, to the, um, if we're out, I'm driving, I'm checking everything down the block, I'm see if any windows or doors are open even on the houses in the block, and I get to the, the park our car, then I have to look and watch right, everything, see who's standing on the corner, see if there are any new faces, anybody standing in front of the church, or anybody that can get within me. By the time I can get out the car, she get out the car, and we get in the door. So I have to do all of that every time for the last 14 years. I have to do that every time I drive up. And many times I don't even go out at night anymore uh, because it's more difficult to recognize any danger on the street because, you know, black people would kill you, isn't it? They'll get a 17-year-old boy to come and shiv me and they'll let him out on bail so he can go home and eat bologna sandwiches with his mother and watch Good Times or play Xbox. And then they bring him to court and give him probation for killing me. And I know it. I know it. God knows I know it. But I want to say something to you. I'm going to say something to you. For eight years, the telephone did not stop ringing with people delivering hate messages to, to this ministry and their worship of Obama, black people, their worship of Obama, the rocks thrown at the church, all the other things that they did, the vandalism that they did. But I have to say this to you. I want to tell you this, that after Obama, Trump came. And you know what I did with Trump? I spoke against him as well. In fact, one of my videos got more than 10 million views when I called Trump the coochie grabber. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. That during the four years I spoke out against Trump, we didn't get one ugly phone call from a white person. Not one. Not one. We didn't get one death threat. And I talked about Trump calling them red nicks and everything, you can, everything under the sun. We didn't get one threatening phone call from anybody white to this church in defense or worship of Donald Trump. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? <laughs> Not once. 
Not in four years time, not one white person called and threatened to kill me. Not one white person called and threatened to build, burn down our church. Not once. Not one. In four years. But in eight years with Obama, eight years, Lord, it was worse than, I, I mean, I thought we were 911 call center. There were so many ugly calls coming in of black people against, well, we're not a black church, but you get the idea. It shows you the level of evil. It shows you the level of depravity. It shows you the level of, of uncivilized. It shows you the level of ignorance. To, to call the church every day, 24 hours, for eight years with threats, send buckets of feces. This, this came prim primarily from the LGBT crowd. But for four years, not one person that was white and a Trump supporter threatened to take my life or to do any harm to this church. Not once. <laughs> Ain't that something? You know, if you had to live my, I don't think most of y'all could stand walking in my shoes one day. I don't, I mean, you look at this and you say, what, uh, how can anybody be as ignorant as these black people? And, and they say I'm, I'm, I'm against them, I'm beating down on them. Am I? <laughs> Am I? Yeah, what I'm teaching Dante Wright would be alive today. George Floyd would be alive today. Michael Brown would be alive. Trayvon Martin would be alive today. But you know, there's just something sick and twisted because Van Jones will tell you, you know who he is. When the police stop you, put your hands on the steering wheel. Act polite. Don't get an attitude. Don't start cussing and fussing. He the police. Let them see your hands so they won't have a reason to shoot you. Right? And if you do that, Van Jones and everybody tell their black children, you know, if you do that, you'll probably get taken to the police station, but you'll live. We'll come get you. But if you do anything else, he's going to shoot you. And yet, when Dante Wright or George Floyd gets killed, or Michael Brown or Trayvon Martin or even Eric Garner gets killed, here they come marching and protesting and burning and looting. What if the man had just said, okay, take me to the police station? None of that would have happened. None of it. And yet they will not get up one time and say, well, you know, he shouldn't have resisted arrest. Not one of them. Not one of them. And for eight years, this same mentality of rebellion, and to, the, to some degree, is still here. There's still Obama worshipers. <laughs> There's a church in the community. This absolutely you. This will kill you. There's a church in this community. They threw maybe the biggest stone. They put her over the arch of their entrance to this to their to their door. We ain't with the church on the corner. We love Obama. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, they put it out there, and it stayed out there for 14 years. The church. <laughs> you're, talking about these, you're talking about the level of debauchery is unprecedented. Even after Obama was no longer president, they still had it out there. But not one call. Not one call came from one Trump supporter to threaten me. Not one. Threaten the church. Not one time. And then I got the, the I didn't lay in the trunk. Oh, you know I did. You know I did. But there's a difference. And I want to pay, take the time to say thank you to the Japheth brother. You know, for at least giving me the opportunity to express my political beliefs. And my, not, they're not political beliefs, let me restate that. My belief in God. Because I was against Trump because he was against God. That's all there was to it. It was against him. And, I, I, and having said, thank you, my Japheth brother, thank you so very much. You were closer to me than my so-called Hamite brother has ever been in all the days he has ever, even the ones that are members of the church, many of them. 
Not all of them, but many of them. And I want to say thank you. But I, but I want to tell you this, that having said that now that Trump's gone, y'all need to come back to Jesus. Listen, Trump ain't never, ain't never solved no problem. Trump has a persona about him of creating problems and then telling you how bad it is, getting you angry at how bad it is. You know, they ain't, they ain't, they ain't two different sense what the difference between Trump and Ben Crump. You know Ben Crump? Ben Crump is that no-talking lawyer. I don't know how on earth that Ben Crump got to be who he is. Ben Crump is that no-talking Hamite lawyer that started with Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and, and George Floyd, and now he's whatever. He, he, they ain't two cents of di what, what's the difference. The only difference between Trump, Donald Trump, and Ben Crump is the skin color. They both do the same thing. They wait for a problem to crop up, and they run in and try to cash in on it. And you J-5 people had a problem with civil rights and Obama, and Trump ran in to cash in on it. And for years, said that Obama was illegal, wasn't born in America, but in order to become president, he said, oh, yeah, well, well, well we, we all know Obama was born in Honolulu. Trump told the same lie to become president that Obama told to become. Obama said he was born in America to become president, and Trump, Trump co-signed that liar. That same lie, Trump gave assent to the same lie that, that Obama to become president. So Trump and Crump are two of the same people. You need to come back to Jesus, my j brother. You need to come on back home to Jesus, and, uh, and you need to give up on Trump. Uh, he ain't for you. Trump is a part of the replacement process. He is not for you. He never has been. Well, I, 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 I would say to you, that if you realize what's going on and what, if you continue to follow the big lie, it's just going to make it easier for people to hate you. It's going to make it easier for people to write laws against you. It's going to make it easier for you to divide the Republican Party. It's going to make it easier to destroy the Southern Baptist churches if y'all keep following Trump because he's unstable. There's no strength there. there. There is no consistency there, and you're not going to have the kind of strength you will have where you unite it. But I want to say thank you. To all of you, I mean, when, you, when, I, when I lay down in my bed at night and I think about for, four, for eight years, I got called a coon. I said, they told me I was an Uncle Ruckus. I was an Uncle Tom. You could, you could feel the hatred of men when I walked past them. The telephone calls, the abuse of the people that picked up the phone for eight years. Worshipping Obama, one of the slick talking liars that the world, slickest talking liar the world has ever seen. But for four years during the days of Trump, not one phone call of hatred, not one from a white man, not one. There's something markedly wrong with the systems, with the people, with the races. There's something wrong. And I'm here to straighten it out. I'm James Ibbett Manning, everybody. I'm the Lord's servant. This is a bit of a news blog we do, looking at spiritual wickedness in high places for the most part, making uh, some observations about it and giving people a biblical foundation to the way of interpreting rather than have uh, uh, Sean Hannity or Laura Ingram or Janine Pirro or Anderson Cooper or Rachel Maydow or Don Lemon. Uh, Rush Limbaugh interpret what's going on in the world. You come to me and I'll tell you based on what the Word of God says. They'll just give you their worldly, sinful view. But the man will tell you what God has said, whether to say yea or nay, whether to go or to stay. You'll be led by the Word of Almighty God. Come to the Manning Report on a daily basis to interpret the spiritual wickedness in high places because there's plenty of it that's going on. And so I am he, I'm the Lord, sir, James David Righteous Rebel Manning, and I'm here to serve you with news and information. Over the years, we have served more than one million meals 
to hungry bellies and hungry people here in the Harlem community. And I wanted you to be able to see that. I want you to see our involvement with youth, our summer youth programs, the uh, our courtyard being used as a, uh, a place where children can be safe, guarded, and protected as they have their miniature swimming pools, um, and a safe place for children to eat that is guarded, that is protecting, protected by our own sense of security, and the wholesome and fresh meals that... Um, that we serve. We, we wanted you to be able to see the mission of this church. And we've been doing this for years. Just recently, one of our members, more than a 30 year member of this church, but it hasn't, not one that, you know, that you would probably find as members of some other churches with their nose stuck up in the air. But her father is now close to death or very sick in the state of South Carolina. And uh, what I said to her, well, I said, well, because she doesn't have money, I said, we will buy you a bus ticket, a round trip bus or train ticket for you to travel to South Carolina to, to be with your father in this time of pandemic. There's very little funding around. There's, there's sickness everywhere. And and she, the thing that just blew me away was she said as she was talking to Elizabeth, she said, but how are you going to do that? To, to pay for me a round trip ticket to, to travel and give me expense money. And because you, know, you got to, Pastor Manning has to feed the children. He has to take, he has to educate the children. He has to buy school supplies for them. He has to pick them up in the mornings and take them back. And then he's got the ministry he has to take care of, all the bills of running the church, of keeping a major house like our house operational, keep the lights on, keep the, how are you going to be able to do that? And she was almost reluctant to take the money because she felt that it would be better served by feeding the children. We gave it to her anyway. But we want you to know that we do a work in this community. There have been a lot of lies told on us. And it's almost unimaginable why some of the people that have lied on us. But I can tell you behind all of it is the LGBTQ community. They don't want us to be successful, but we are, and we're going to continue to be successful in serving the meals that we're serving and serving the people that we are. And the LGBTQ community will not take us down. They are not going to take our church, yet they have defamed us. They've written ugly newspaper articles about us. They've marched against us. They've done a whole lot of ugly things. But you see what we have done and that's not even the half of our service to children and to the needy in terms of our homeless shelters and the things that we've done over the years. And we will continue. And probably the lies and the smears and the ugly newspaper articles and the wicked spirits and the so-called I ain't for the black man, that is not going to go away. I don't expect it to go away. I don't. But I do tell you this, that we will succeed against all of that, for God is with us, and I am his servant.